The novel is a formidable subject. In the words of Montreux Abel Chablis, it is a fiction in prose of a certain extent. We'll call it 50,000 words. Our subject is a particular type of English literature, the English novel specifically. Now, in our discussion of the English novel, we must remember that true academic excellence is one of the highest achievements of modern society, but real intellect cannot be shared, and real intellectuals are extremely rare. Discussing novels chronologically, as pseudo-scholars are wont to do, is meaningless, because novels, and novelists who write them, come from immensely varied backgrounds. It's for this reason that we shall disregard time entirely in our analysis of the novel. While history develops, art stands still. History builds upon itself, but the human mind, which is the source of art and creativity, has remained unchanged throughout the span of our discussion. Certain literary techniques have likewise remained constant over time, such as fantasy, humor, and conversation. We cannot entirely ignore this literary tradition, but we'll avoid it when we can. Oh. <laughs> a story is a narrative of events arranged in time sequence. It acts as the spine of the novel, connecting the beginning and the end, and holding the fragile framework in the middle in its place. The only thing the story asks of the reader is curiosity. The audience must crave to know what happens next above all else. The story, with its events arranged in time sequence, relates the life in relation to time, and the novel as a whole attempts to convey the life by the values of that life. The delicate variable of time must be perfectly balanced to achieve the intended effect of the story. Its chronology cannot be interrupted without disrupting the coherence of the novel. Story is the portion of a writer's work which begs to be read and stimulates the ear rather than the eye. The king died, <laughs> then the queen died, <laughs> the king died, then the queen died of grief. Historians depict precisely those characters that are in existence. It is the novelist's job to tell us what we do not know, to expand on the facts and expose the innermost workings of the characters. These offspring of, of novels are only real when the novelist knows everything about them, but perfect knowledge is an illusion. This is the reason why fiction can seem more real than life. There are five essential parts of human existence which novelists must reproduce. Birth, food, sleep, love, and death. But authors interact with these in different ways. Birth and death are both unavoidable and incomprehensible. Birth is often treated as a little package that is delivered to the reader and then ignored until the baby can express its thoughts and feelings, while death is dwelled upon and analyzed much more. Food is an even more constant part of our lives, and we often consume it without thought, but it can also be aesthetic and rejuvenating. In some literature, food brings people together, while nearly a third of our li life is spent sleeping, dreams are introduced only with a purpose in the novel, and are otherwise entirely ignored. Through love, humans both give and receive. It is the emotional web that connects humans to one another. Characters in novels are forced to adapt themselves to other requirements of, the, of their creator, to accommodate the novel's, novel's other aspects. As realistic as these characters seem, they merely parallel real people. They cannot be expected to mesh completely with real life, but each bit of a character corresponds to some part of life. There are two main kinds of characters, flat and round. Flat characters are caricatures. They are formed around a single idea and can be expressed in a single statement. They are useful to the novelist because readers readily recognize them and remember them easily. So they rarely need to be introduced and never need to be reintroduced. While these flat characters are useful, they are best when comical, and are, are entirely unfit for tragic roles. Round characters, on the other hand, elicit the reader's emotions and surprise in a convincing way. The novelist changes the point of view among these characters to keep the reader engaged. Hi, flat. I'm round. Like, I have no thoughts in my head. Got it. Yeah, so cool. Okay. Yesterday I found out that I was philosophical. 
Oh. And right now I'm complex. <laughs> and I'm really complicated right now. So oh. compliment yeah, yeah. Complicated. complicated. <laughs> complex. That's too hard. The simplest approach to defining any aspect of a novel is determining what it demands from the reader. Fantasy requires the reader to pay something extra. It asks the reader to accept either the supernatural or its absence. Fantasy breaks from the generally literal tone of novels and elicits varied responses from readers. It has a specially personal appeal. The supernatural is expressed in only a few ways in literature. Introducing extraordinary characters to normal settings. Introducing normal characters to extra extraordinary settings, messing with personality, and parody or adaptation. Fantasies cannot introduce new ideas, so even a work that begins with a fantasy by adaptation becomes something else if it contains something new. Parody and adaptation give novelists who cannot create characters a place to start their work, and fantasy in general allows authors to make the peculiar stage and characters necessary to a novel. Good morning, students, and thank you for joining me on Casual Friday. Today's lecture will be on prophecy. Prophecy is a tone of voice authors use to address a universal theme by implication. Prophetic novelists produce characters that stand for something more than themselves and imply that the universe is an extension of these characters. Prophecy demands from readers humility and the suppression of the sense of humor. Prophetic works are unified, not purposefully obscure, and composed in a remoter emotional state than fantasies are. Follow out the sides of our coffins, that we may lie together forever. Oh, Catherine. Catherine! <laughs> the final aspects of the novel, pattern and rhythm, contribute primarily to the aesthetic appeal of the book as a whole. Pattern is the novel's overall shape and draws mostly from plot. An example of pattern is a grand chain in which the character, after the activities of the plot, finds himself exactly where he started. The weakness of a strict pattern is that it shuts the doors on life and has a tendency to bore the reader. Where pattern is the overall form of the novel, rhythm is repetition plus variation that stitches the novel together from the inside. It vanishes and reappears. When is a flower not a flower? When is a swing not a swing? <laughs> well, I should like to close with speculations about the novel's future. We have no right to entertain them. We cannot predict the future of the novel because we have disregarded its past. The content of the novel may, and will, change, but the novel itself will not change until human nature changes. Thus, when considering the full course of humanity, the evolution of the, of the novel will imply the development of humanity. Unacceptable. <laughs>